Good morning, everyone. I hope everyone is uh, safe and doing well with the family and just enjoying uh, the time that you have there. Uh, this morning, we're going to continue in our series in the book of James, and we've uh, definitely enjoyed it. I hope you are enjoying it as well. I hope it's been a, a blessing to your life. And uh, James has definitely challenged us in how we live our day to day lives. He's really helped us, and he's really done that through the power of the Holy Spirit and just the fact that it's God's inspired word. And so this morning we're going to be in James uh, chapter 3. Okay, James chapter 3 uh, this morning. And just remember, uh, just remembering a few things that we heard in the weeks past, uh, which was basically that we should have joy in trials. That whatever trial that you're going through in life, that you ought, ought to have joy in that trial. And knowing that God is, is working in your life, maturing uh, your heart and your life, and doing so, so that you're uh, constantly and continually uh, changed into the image of Christ. You know, whatever it is that you're going through, God is working in your life behind the scenes. Also, we want to be reminded that uh, you know, sin is also lying at the door. Sin is, is trying to consume your life, trying to consume uh, your mind. Uh, but there is a way out. And we have to rec recognize and reflect on God's goodness. That God is good. That He is the Father of lights. Uh, that, that in whom is no variables, variableness, neither shadow of turning, that, that God doesn't change, that God uh, never changes, and He's always going to be good. And He calls us to live the Word of God. We, we continually hear the Word of God. We're continually confronted by it, that mirror, that glass. And because of it, we can either be changed or we can either uh, be deceived. And of course, uh, God also, we also saw in weeks past that God is calling us also to be um, people that would not see classes, that we would just see people all as, as uh, people that deserve to be loved, that, that people that all need to be cared for and ministered to. It doesn't matter if, if someone is, is the, rich, the, the rich class or someone that's a little more privileged or someone that's not, not as well off. Uh, God cares for all of them and He wants us to see everyone as such. Also, we saw last week and was very, very interesting was this that God wants us to live our faith out, that God calls us to work, that our day-to-day -day life ought to be a, re a reflection, a demonstration of our faith in God, that we can't separate uh, faith and works. We saw that last week. It's, it's just impossible. We saw that faith and works are like uh, the glorious combination of bacon and eggs. You just can't have bacon without eggs. I mean, you can, but it's just a marriage made in heaven. Okay, so faith and works work together for our good. And for God's glory. So we see chapter 3 uh, this morning where James confronts us in just the practical issues of life. If you, can't, if you haven't seen a theme here that James is confronting us with all areas that we struggle with in life. He confronts us with areas that, that we have to um, come, into, come into contact with. We all, we all struggle with every area, every aspect that James has touched on, we all struggle with. And so James chapter 3 is no different. He's talking about... The tongue. This morning, I uh, want to just present for you, uh, put a muzzle on it. Put, put a muzzle on it. James is challenging us to, to use our, our, our tongue, and it really, it's impossible without the help of God. As we're going to see, he says in James chapter 3, My brethren, be not many masters, knowing that we shall receive the greater condemnation. For in many things we offend all. If any man offend not in word, the same as a perfect man, able also to brittle the whole body. Behold, we put bits in in the mouth in, in the horses' mouths that they may obey us, and we turn about their whole body. Behold also the ships, which though they be so great, and are driven of fierce winds, yet are they turned about with a very small helm, whithersoever the governor listeth. Even so the tongue is a little member and boasteth great things. Behold how great a matter a little fire kindleth, and the tongue is a fire a world of iniquity, so is the tongue among our members, that it defileth the whole body, and setteth on fire the course of nature and is set on fire of hell for every kind of beasts and of birds and of serpents and of things in the sea is tame and hath been tamed of mankind but the tongue can no man tame it is an unruly evil full of deadly poison therewith bless we god even the father and therewith and therewith curse we men which are made after the similitude of god out of the same mouth proceeded blessing and cursing but my brethren these things ought not so to be Doth a fountain send forth at the same time, at the same place, sweet water and bitter? Can the fig tree, my brethren, bear olive berries, either a vine, figs? So can no fountain 
both yield salt water and fresh. And there James ends. And really, it's a part two. Okay, There's a part two next week where we're going to see, uh, with God's help, that there's two kinds of wisdoms out there in this world. If you haven't found that out, um, and really if you haven't reflected on it, that there's a worldly wisdom and there's a sensual uh, devilish wisdom. And we'll see that next week. But this week, let's deal with our tongue. It's very clear through the reading of the passage that we're going to deal with the tongue. That's so important. It's so vital because we use the tongue for everything. Uh, we use it to communicate. It's a, a what a precious tool that God has given us to be able to commune one with another. We, you, we're able to use words, and, and nowadays, uh, you know, we have uh, Zoom meetings where we're able to connect with with uh, fellow church members, and we have so much uh, social media and so many ways to to connect one with another. That um, God has been so good to extend our, our forms of communication, and so. Um, you know, it, it seems like gone are the days of, of sending letters, and it seems like a lost art, but still, uh, we, we still find ways to communicate and use words. And words are very important to God, and how we, how we speak and how we communicate one with another is very important to God. We see, first of all, that James addresses his uh, fellow believers by way of, really, he wants them to take heed. He wants them to, to really be careful with how they conduct themselves. He says in verse 1, My brethren, be not many masters, knowing that we shall receive the greater condemnation. He says, My brothers, uh, be careful with wanting to be a, a, a teacher or a master. Where that, that word masters there has the, the, the meaning of, of being a, a teacher or a doctor of the law. Because many of the early Christians were uh, Jewish believers. They would oftentimes take turns getting up there and presenting uh, um, passages of scripture or expound, expounding on or explaining passages of scripture so they had kind of that, that, that Jewish background where where many men where many uh, church members at the same time were, were, were possibly gifted in preaching or teaching the word of God and so James is saying uh, don't uh, if you're going to all be uh, desiring to be teachers just do that with this in mind okay he's not saying don't desire to be a preacher he's not saying don't desire you know, uh, to teach. He's saying, if you're going to do that, take heed that you use your words well. That's why he says this in the second part of uh, verse uh, verse one. He says, knowing that we shall receive the greater condemnation, knowing that God shall scrutinize our work. That, that there is great judgment. That there's it's a high calling to be a, a preacher or a teacher or any kind of, of a church worker. It's a great high calling of God upon our lives, upon those that serve in, in ministry. It's a great high calling. It comes at a great price. It comes with great scrutiny, not just by um, people in, in that the, the view our lives, that view whether we're living according to the word of God, but God himself uh, is, very, is, is very, much, uh, very much cares whether we're living what we preach. It's very important. And that's why uh, James is getting a hold of him. He says, hey, my brethren, be careful. Be careful desiring to be a teacher, desiring to be a, a, a doctor of the law, desiring to expound the scriptures to others. Know that with that comes great responsibility. Know that uh, to whom much is given, much is required. Just know that is basically what James is saying here in verse 1. For in many things we offend all. If any man offend not in word, the same is a perfect man, able also to brittle the whole body. James says this, in many, there's many ways in which we offend all. There, there's many ways in which I'm sure I've offended uh, people in my church, people that I come into contact with on a day-to-day -day basis, day -day basis. There are many ways in which I, uh, I offend others. Many ways, uh, words I say, words I don't say, things I do, things I don't do. Uh, there are many ways in which I, I, I annoy others. And I, I'm sure it's the same way, uh, the other way around as well. There, there are many ways in which people maybe don't realize uh, that, they, that they are being annoying, that they are being a nuisance. And James says that. James says, hey, there, there are many, in many ways that we can offend all people that we come into contact with. But he says, if any man not offend, uh, if any man offend not in word, the same is a perfect man. He says, like, if there's a man that, that is able to uh, get, a, get a good grip on, on, his, on his mouth and, and on the words that he communicates and is able to be gracious in his speech, if there's a man among, among you like that, says that same man is a perfect man. That same man is mature. That same man is, is, is doing well in his walk with Christ, is, is, is growing in his walk with Christ because he's able to avoid the fact of offending others 
by way of his mouth. That's why James tells us to be swift to hear and slow to speak and slow to wrath. That's why James told us that back in chapter 1 and verse 19. It's so vital. He's basically connecting. See, the whole book of James connects. It's, it's, it's a puzzle that connects. And you can't get away from that. He says, you know, if a man is able to, con if a man is able to control what he speaks and what he says, that same man is probably able to control what he does. Because half of, half of our sins come from what we say translated into what we do. And it, it has a, 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 a cause and effect to it. You know, the things that we say cause others to take certain actions. The things that we say cause even ourselves to react a certain way. So the things that we say, James says, is very important. Because if a man can control what he says, he can control his life. It gives us two illustrations from nature to really get our attention on the fact of how powerful the mouth is. He uses two powerful illustrations at that. He says, you know what? Behold, we put bits and horses uh, in the horses' mouths that they may obey us. And we turn about their whole body. The horse is a powerful, powerful creature. I remember going with my dad years ago and he had a job in, in, in Napa where he would uh, handle horses. And... Uh, I remember seeing just the way he would care for the horses, just clean them out, clean out the stalls, feed them, uh, um, you know, give them a little bit of exercise, just do the daily maintenance in, in the horse stalls. I remember seeing uh, my dad had a job like that for a while, and I remember seeing just the way he would handle them and, and give them the, the exercise, have them run around the, the, the little the pin where, where they were held for exercise, and how they would go around in a circle. They were, they were con uh, controlled by, by, you know, a bit. In fact, a lot of times, in even in, inside their pen, you know, they were given certain horses if they were, uh, you know, tended to be uh, weren't fully trained yet or were kind of mean, you know, would buy other horses. They they would put a, a complete a full on muzzle. It wouldn't just be a bit. It would be a full on muzzle. But for for people, those of you that, that know how to ride horses or you know someone that knows how to ride horses, they you know they have a rein. They put a rein on them. They put a bit so that they're able to move the horse around and control that powerful animal. It's such a powerful animal. But it's controlled by a, a small thing, a, a little bit. And then he gives an illustration of a ship. How they, behold, he says, verse 4, Behold also ships, which though they be so great, big and mighty ships, and are driven of fierce winds, yet they are yet are they turned about with a very small helm, whithersoever the governor listed. He says that, you know, if, if you've ever been on a ship, if you've ever been on a cruise boat, any, a boat of any type, and they, they are controlled by a rudder. That rudder is a small uh, part in comparison to the size of a boat but that small rudder is, is key it's vital to controlling the boat it's key and, and very vital he says so the governor listed so he's talking about the second part there of or the last part of verse 4 he says you know with that rudder with that small helm that small uh, small helm is basically the rudder he says with that small helm with that rudder the governor the the driver of the boat can drive and sway that boat whether wherever he desires wherever he so pleases he's able to control that powerful boat by way of the rudder and so mankind has been given uh, through the help of god um, through the power of the mind but through the help of god has been given just an amazing tool with their imagination and able to control great things and able to build great things build great towers Think about the, uh, all those amazing pyramids in Egypt and, uh, you know, amazing landmarks, uh, through, uh, amazing just buildings throughout the world that you can think of that come to mind. All the amazing uh, skyscrapers in Chicago, New York, uh, you know, I think of the Eiffel Tower in Paris, just amazing structures, the Colosseum in Rome. God has given man a mind to control and to, and to build all those things, yet man still hasn't figured out how to control the tongue. God, God has given man the ability to do all these things and have dominion over all these things, yet man has yet to figure out how to control the tongue. We'll touch more on that a little bit here in a little bit. In a little bit. And so he says this. He says, verse 5, Look, the tongue is a, a, a little member among your whole body as a whole, yet it boasts great things. The tongue is very small compared to the hand and to the head and, and, and to your legs and your arms and, and your internal organs. It's, it's a very small uh, body part in comparison to the to to yourself as a whole yet it commands so much attention yet it, yet it, it, it can be so destructive is is what James says it, it boasts great things it, it, it it's drowned in arrogance and the way that we speak a lot of times is that we make ourselves look better than 
what we really are. We, we, uh, we dress ourselves up and we explain stories and we say things in a way that makes ourselves look, look not too bad. And then we say things and put stuff in such a way that the other person looks worse than we do. And we make ourselves, we put ourselves up on this little, on this, on this pedestal of, of pride and arrogance. And, and the mouth is able to do such things. The, the, the tongue does such things. James says, be careful, be careful. That, that, that tongue boasts of great things. Being such a small member, it does such great things and terrible things. He says there, and then <clears throat> the second part of verse 5, Behold how great a matter a little fire, a little fire kindleth. A little matter there. A, a little bit of wood can, can start a great fire. The tongue with just a few words can get going and create a fire that no one saw coming and create a long-lasting effects. The tongue, verse 6, is a fire, a world of iniquity. So is the tongue among our members, that it defileth the whole body, and setteth on fire the course of nature, and is set on fire of hell. Here, of course, here in the state of California, we it seems like every summer we have some sort of fire that we, we struggle with, wildfires in the summertime. James says, you know, your tongue can set wildfires ablaze. Your tongue has that power to affect lives in such a way that, that it can cut down to the to the innermost parts of someone's being, of someone's soul. That your words have that effect. That your words can 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 cut someone down so low that can cause someone to be to, to fall into such a, a, a state of, of a panic or, or depression if your words are so sharp and so cutting. That your words have that, that type of power. They really do. Yet at the same time, the, the tongue has the power to encourage, to, to edify, to strengthen, to bless, uh, the power of kindness, the power of uh, just being a uh, help and, and being generous and, and being loving and loving as well. And so we see that our tongue has uh, the capacity for good, but it definitely has. James is definitely, uh, he pulls out punches and shows us that our tongue has a capacity for evil, a great capacity for wrongdoing, for hurt, for pain, for destruction. Verse 6 very much illustrates that. He says, verse 7, For every kind of beast and of birds and of serpents and of things in the sea is tamed and hath been tamed of mankind. You know, here in San Diego, we have the, the wonderful privilege. We have one of the probably best zoos in the world, one of the premier zoos in the world I hear. I actually haven't been to it, but I know that we have a, a great zoo. You know, man has been able to, uh, again, through the wisdom that God has given him, been able to control, been able to have the, that dominion, over creatures, all types of creatures you can find in that zoo, all types of creatures from the sea, all types of flying creatures, all types of you know tigers, um, lions, all types of creatures, bears. They, they they can all be brought into dominion by mankind. Yet he says this, <clears throat> verse eight. But the tongue can no man tame. It is an unruly evil, full of deadly poison. Says mankind has the power to control all types of powerful animals. It has the power, and mankind has been given that type of wisdom, that type of intelligence to put uh, dominion over them. It's a God-given thing. God gave that down to Adam, and Adam used it uh, for the glory of God to to name animals. Uh, but we see that though man has all that incredible power over animals and, and been able to build great buildings and has been able to do all kinds of wonderful and, and wondrous things, yet man has yet to figure out how to control his tongue. Yet uh, man has yet to figure out how to do it. It's impossible. Verse 8 says that the tongue is an unruly evil. That it's impossible to control. It's a, it's a wicked and des uh, desperately wicked device that we have within us. Full of deadly poison that your words have the power to kill. Your, per, your words can hurt someone so much that it can ruin them. That can hurt them to the, to the very core of their being. They have that type of power. I'm not saying that your words do. I'm not, I'm not accusing anyone. I'm just saying that they have that potential to hurt. You've heard the, 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 the phrase, the saying that, that sticks and stones you know, are, may not break my bones. Uh, and when certainly words can't hurt me. And I know I'm not saying it 100% correctly. But... The idea there is that, you know, a person is, is basically saying, you know, words can't affect me. But that statement is definitely not true. It's definitely not true because words have effects. Words have great power. God's words have great power. God's words have the power to bring 
that which is dead back to life. God's words have the power to change lives. And God has given us communication. And we are to use communication. We are to use our words for the glory of God, not for the destruction of our fellow men. Not for the destruction of those that we care the most about, those in our family, those that are those that are our friends. I know I've been I've been guilty of, of not using my tongue well, not using my tongue for the for the glory of God, of of, of buttering people up and, and not speaking truth when I should, of, of being a hypocrite, of, of lying, of, of of not being truthful, of just using the tongue for selfish reasons. Uh, of backbiting, of talking behind someone's back, of, of really uh, of just mistreating people, of being cruel, of being uh, unkind, of being uh, just downright nasty and wicked. I know I've done that with my tongue. And I know it's something that we all struggle with. It's something that we are going to have to struggle with till the day we die. It's something that we can't defeat. It's something that we can't conquer in and of ourselves. We need the help of God. That's the only way that you're going to be able to have uh, control over your tongue. That's the only way that you're going to be able to have victory. It's through the help of God. We see there in, in verse 9 through, through 12, basically, he helps us understand that there's a consistency that must come from our speech. There is a consistency that must come. That, that we can't just come to church on, on Sunday and bless God and say, wow, you know, praise God and oh, brother, I missed you, and oh, hallelujah, and oh, how I enjoyed that service, and oh, oh how I enjoyed uh, that preaching and that song service, oh, how I enjoyed all those things, yet, at the same time, at home, we, we have a bad spirit, and maybe we use words we ought not to use, maybe we use not just unkind words, but maybe uh, straight up curse words, maybe we're, we're, we're using, we're using dirty jokes at, at work, or whatever the case is, maybe you're using dirty work, uh, dirty jokes among your friends, and maybe it's not for you for you it's not just not so much the tongue but it's what you send out in message or what you send out on, on social media how you communicate by email whatever the, the 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 resource you have for communicating sometimes we we don't you know at church or among god's people will will we'll, we'll pretend to have a, a good speech a, a really nice way of communicating but among others among those that we have no testimony with we, we communicate however we want. Whatever comes to mind, we say. That's not God's way. God doesn't say, whatever comes to your mind, say it. No, God wants us to be swift to hear, slow to speak, and slow to wrath. That's God's plan for communication to the believer. And that's how we ought to communicate. We ought to think before we speak. Is this word going to be edifying? Is this word going to be christ honor? Is this word going to be encouraging and a help? Yes, we ought to speak with truth, truth and love, but it's not to bring others down. It's not to hurt. It's not to castigate. It's not to slander. And James basically says this in uh, verse 10 through the end here. It says, Out of the same mouth proceedeth blessing and cursing, where rather these things ought not so to be. Doth a fountain send, send forth at the same place uh, sweet water and bitter? Can the fig tree, my brethren, bear olive trees, either a, 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 a vine, figs, so can no fountain both yield salt water and fresh. Who is a wise man? Or, I'm sorry, that, that was the end there in, in verse 12. But basically he's saying this. That how can you uh, just bless God one day and bless God with part of your life and then at the same time hurt others? At the same time talk bad about others? And he uses illustrations from nature to help us out. He says, it's impossible for a, a fountain of water to give forth that salty water. You know, we're close to the ocean here and we have a whole lot of salty water. We've got you know, God's swimming pool, the, the Pacific Ocean out here. It's impossible for a, a single source of, of water to have both salt water and fresh. That, it's not going to happen. It's impossible. And God says it's impossible for you to, to speak highly of, of God in, in church or speak highly of God in front of others. Uh, and, and then behind the scenes or behind the scenes in private, you're, you're just uh, you're talking however you want. You're, you're cursing others. You're, you're not being truthful. You're, you're not being helpful. You're using kind of, or you're using cruel words. You're saying it's impossible. You're either one or the other. Is what is what God wants us to understand. Now, you can't just use different words in, in different areas with with different people. You can't be one person with your family and one person at church and one person at work. No, that, that doesn't work in, in God's economy. God wants us to understand and and really take heed to how we speak. That we ought to speak the same the same way everywhere. That our speech ought to always be 
uh, lifting up of the name of Christ and exalting Him. And we always ought to be witnesses. We ought to use our words to be witnesses for the Lord Jesus Christ. Of course, he uses a... Uh, then he, he closes us out with the illustration of, of fig trees and how fig trees, of course, can't, they can't bear olives. There's no way. It's a fig tree. It's not going to bear an olive. And then... Can a, can a vine produce figs? No, a vine's gonna produce grapes. Cannot produce figs. So then, can no fountain both yield salt water and fresh? You know what? No, no, there, again, there, he goes back to the illustration of the body of water. That there's no way that, that salt water and fresh water can, can dwell one with another. You're not gonna get that out of the same fountain. It's impossible. So God wants us to realize, to understand that the way we speak ought to be the same everywhere. And it's impossible to control. He says the tongue can no man tame. It's an unruly evil. You can't do it. It's impossible to, to do in and of yourself. It's, a whole, it's only something that can happen by way of the Holy Spirit of God. By you submitting yourself to Christ and, and, doing, and being a Galatians 2.20 Christian and letting Christ live in you and through you, only then can you ha have the help of God to be able to communicate the words that God wants you to communicate. Only then can you be that mature Christian that James wants us to be. James is communicating to Christians that they be wise, that they grow, that they be perfect, that they be mature, but that can only take place when we submit our speech, when we submit our words to the Holy Spirit of God. When we realize, first of all, that we do have a problem with our speech. If you don't realize that, well, today is the day that you realize that we have a problem with the words we, that, we, that we say. We ought to, they ought to be seasoned with salt and, 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 and just covered in grace. They ought to be truthful. They ought to be loving. But they ought to be led by the Holy Spirit of God. You know, Peter struggled with that. At times, he, he prays in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. He said that he would die for him, that he would go, that he would go into battle for him, that he would do anything for him. And guess what? He denied him three times. His speech betrayed him, by the way. It's interesting. I was just in study this week and realizing that he was called out. The people called him out. His speech betrayed him. He had the speech of a, of a, of a Galilean. You know, he was, he was talking about loving God one moment, and the next moment, he was cursing. He was even, he was even cussing and cursing. You know, Peter had to come through that on his own. Even James and John, when they asked, you know, they, they, of course they loved the Lord, but they had their moments where they wanted Christ to even strike down and cast down that, that, that Samaritan village. Yeah, that ought not to be with believers. One moment we're, we're cursing, we're talking bad about others behind their back, and another moment we're, we're praising God, we're, we're in love with the Lord, we're lifting up the name of the Lord. That ought not to be. They, they, God is calling us, and God is using James to call, and calling us to live a, a mature Christian life. And a mature Christian life, uh, praise and ask God to help it to the power of, of the scriptures that we not be two types of water, not be two types of trees, that we be a single uh, a Christian that lives a, a singular life, a life that is just completely focused on Christ and not trying to please man, but really trying to please God. And so I hope that today this, this message has been a challenge. It's been a challenge to me this whole week. It's been, a, whoa, it's been heavy, heavy on my heart, convicting. Because it's something that we often don't think that we struggle with, but we, we really do. And that's why we have it here in the Word of God, to challenge us and to change us and to grow us little by little. God is doing that work in your heart and life. Well, let's, let's give it up to the Lord uh, this week. Let's meditate on these things and let God change us. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you for this morning, God, and this challenge that you've given us to, to grow. Lord, to grow in you, God. And it's impossible for us to control that tongue unless we give it up to you, God. And through the help of the Holy Spirit, only then can we uh, control the things that we say. And all of that comes from what, a, what is abounding in the heart and mind. So God, help us to have clean hearts and clean minds so that, I mean, we, so that we may utter pure words, God. So that we, we may utter better uh, the, the gospel of Christ, Lord. So we pray all these things and we're thankful for them in Jesus' name. Amen.